I'm now not the moderator. Um, I'm, a, if you like, a presenter now. And um, is it on? I got to turn this on. Okay, it's all right. So what I'd like to do is, is show you what do you get when you apply a complexity lens to leadership, and um, and maybe in two words, astonishing results. That's what you get. You get astonishing results. <laughs> Can you predict them? Absolutely not. <laughs> Can you guarantee him? Hell no. Because that's why they're astonishing. You know, if you could predict them or guarantee them, they wouldn't be astonishing. Um, so, you know, there's a paradox there. Is that, yes, you can predict them, but no, you can't. Just to my background, because, I, you know, this is in the, in the words of Monty Python, and now for something completely different. Um, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm not an academic. Um, and I learned so much from all of you. I, rather than just thanking Jan for inviting me, I'd also like to thank all of the speakers. I've got 15 pages of notes, which I'll go away and read, and maybe I'll begin to understand half of what I heard. Um, my background is a practitioner, maybe by way of introduction, but also a personal story of how I stumbled into this whole field of complexity science. And it was 30 years ago um, when I was a, a captain in the British Army, part of a team rewriting the plans for the defense of Western Europe. Um, and there was a decision made by the Germans in the early 80s to, um, to go from positional defense to mobile defense, because it was realized that there was no way we would stop the Warsaw Pact if they invaded by sitting in our trenches. <laughs> and, and, and that created a huge change of mindset that was necessary because it was clear that positional <clears throat> defense mindset and command and control mindset would not work in a highly mobile, aka complex, we didn't call it that, um, but it's looking back, it was a complex environment. And uh, the astonishing results we got, I was lucky enough having been involved at the strategic level to be uh, promoted to major, I had one of those careers where you know, you reach a level of incompetence and they either sack you or promote you. And in my military career, I got lucky every time. Um, and I, I, I was part of a combat team um, and, and we had to change what command and control meant. And basically it meant that you pushed every single decision you could to the lowest possible level. So as a major responsible for um, a whole lot of engineering, uh, armor, artillery, infantry assets in a mobile environment, you know, the decisions that doctrine said I should be making uh, were pushed down to the lowest, to the 10 levels down. Um, and that got astonishing results in terms of affecting an attack which would normally take 20 minutes to organize, would take 20 seconds to organize. And you know, for those of you who want to hear the stories, I'll tell over lunch how we did that. Um, I then stumbled into um, complexity again. I couldn't understand why that worked. You know, how can all of the traditional command and control doctrine go out of the window? And it wasn't until I read a book by Gleip called Chaos that I thought, at last, here is something that explains why this can happen. In consulting um, with Ernst & Young, which is my next career, I worked with the Ernst & Young Innovation Unit. I think they were the first to use stuff out of the Santa Fe Institute into business, as far as I know. Um, and, uh, and again, astonishing results, um, getting a culture change in an organization in one month where normally a program would take one year um, by using some of that thinking. Um, and then in business, and I then became an academic and used it in my research and teaching. I was nagged and nagged and nagged to publish. I didn't like writing. And in the end, we wrote up the book, um, which has the research. It was meant to be a PhD, but the Dutch university that I had done the deal with three years earlier suddenly turned around and asked for 30,000. You know, it was a Dutch university, I should have seen it coming. Um, so Dr. Schmocka. Um, and then since then, we, you know, the research was published three years ago, four years ago. And, and since then, um, we've formed a disorganization and taken, using a complexity lens, or what we think is a complexity lens, uh, into business and, and around the world. Um, these are all places and some that we've done it. The industry is in two and a half thousand executives and managers have been through this sort of process and you know more or less they they um, they get astonishing results with it. Um, 
sort of the results, some of the results that we get, this is from Nokia and Siemens, a, a, a six month payback on the development program. Um, so um, these are the sort of results that they've had. And what we, what, what, what we do is we, we encourage a mindset change from the deterministic control approach to leadership, which is still okay, still good, to understanding when it's good to have the non-deterministic, non-control, let go approach to leadership. So what I thought I'd do is just run through uh, some of the methodologies, some of the models, some of the concepts we use, and these can be transferred from any environment to any environment. They're, they're very common. Um, for those of you, this is the only sell thing pitch I get. The only, for those of you that want to get a copy of the book, um, I have a copy here that you can have a look at, try before you buy, and uh, some discount vouchers from my publisher, who's very generous. Um, so, what is, the, what is the methodology we use? Um, and essentially, it's at three levels. Uh, the first level is the strategic, the second is organizational, the third is individual. And, and at the strategic level, using complexity science and understanding why leadership needs to change. Um, once I think you've got uh, leaders saying, okay, I understand why, you can begin to talk about the what, but until you've said why, you're not going to go anywhere. Uh, the second level is the organizational level. So sort of what principles do you need to have in place that can be transferred from the team to organizational or industry to industry uh, to solve complex issues? Um, and I use the word solve here because I don't think you can solve complexity. I think complexity is wonderful, I think it's fantastic, I think it's embraced. <coughs> but I've learned that you need to speak the language of the person you're talking with uh, in order to get them to understand you, rather than speak the language that you know and try and convince them of your <coughs> viewpoint. So we talk about solving complexity, but you know, entrepreneur, you, it's not something to be solved, it's something to be embraced and, 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 and loved. Uh, and finally, um, you know, how, how you can go about at an individual level to get these things done. And the, the stuff we use uh, for various uh, lenses from complexity is listed there. Fractals, uh, ABM, uh, Boyd's is the one we use a lot of. Emergence, we use the Canadian model from uh, Snowden and Boone. Universality from uh, Fiegenbaum, Multiply, Asis, Maturana and Borella. Lorenz's Butterfly. We use uh, Kaufman's buttons, uh, based transition stuff, attractors flow. And also, we add into this uh, Chinese and Asian wisdom. Uh, because what's interesting is if you look at uh, the science of complexity, a lot of it you can see reflected in some of the ancient Asian philosophies. Um, and there's a very good book called The Tower of Physics by uh, uh, Peter Kapka, which makes some very good parallels saying, look, it's interesting. A lot of the new science is coming up. Actually, people were saying this sort of thing thousands of years ago. They just weren't talking about it scientifically. So we see a sort of like convergence between ancient Chinese and Asian wisdom from Asia converging with the sort of modern Western chaos, mathematics, and complexity science. Um, by the way, if any of you've got a question, just stick your hand up as we go along. Um, well, I'll take questions at the end, but if you want, you know, because I do tend to talk a lot very quickly. So how do we do the why? The, the contextual setting is, is basically, and what we do is we ask questions, we don't push, we pull. I'm, I'm going to be, this is very much push, push, push. You know, if we have time, this takes a day, and we would spend a, probably a morning on this alone by pulling and getting this as a, an answer from the individuals. Um, and that's based on the idea of morphic resonance. If you believe we're all connected um, in a system, if you, you know, if you believe that we're all part of the system and that every part of that system holographically is represented inside us, which is called morphic resonance, um, which is a sort of another complexity view, although written by a person they said they should burn the book, um, essentially it's not a question of how do you explain something, it's what questions can you ask an agent in the system so the answer that they give will reflect the things you're talking about. So we use a lot of pull in our approach to uh, development rather than push. So um, one of the things that we start with is, is, you know, the world we live in and understanding and what's going on. And essentially what people come up with is 
You know, if you take the 4,000 year view, uh, a lot of the changes nowadays is due to technology, um, and military technology is where most of it's spent. And that's the sort of change we have happening in a racial period of time. And that rolls over to communication technology, transportation technology, and all of these artifacts have an impact on humans or the monkeys on the planet, because we use this as an intergalactic exercise. And, and so human awareness has jumped as well. And this, in human species terms, would be called shock. You, know, you introduce this amount of change in a short period of time, and you get shock. And if I went back, it whoop, shock. That was a sort of short period of change in a short period of time sort of thing. Um, and so, and so, you know, we're running around going, oh, booga, 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 you know, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. This is a mnemonic from the US defense, which is becoming more and more apparent now, more and more used. Booga, and oh my god, everything's complex, and, you know, we have workshops and we have foresight conferences because we really don't know how to deal with it. And I think, you know, welcome to planet Earth, nothing to worry about, relax. There's nothing to do with you, nothing to do with your organization. This is just a natural. Thing. What's interesting, though, is despite that change, one thing that hasn't changed is our assumption of leadership. You know, 4,000 years ago, you had one pharaoh at any point in time. A thousand years later, one mayor. A thousand in a Roman in a Greek city. A thousand years later, generally one emperor. A thousand years later, one king. And today, in a typical organisation, you get one chief executive. So we haven't changed our assumption of what leadership is, um, and that's called a discontinuity or bifurcation. Um, we have changed the context of leadership as a species far faster than we can change our assumption of leadership. Um, which is why a lot of people, a lot of leaders, wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, why me? Um, so we explore the ramifications of that. And one of the ramifications, and I'm going to ask you to do a very quick experiment. Um, and what I'd like you to do is to um, write down a number. Okay? And I'm going to ask you to write down a number. This is your secret number. Okay? So. And the number I'm going to ask you to write down, okay, so what they did is they did some research, and what they looked at is organizations that have been through step change. Okay, so big, successful change programs. And what they did is they looked at the solutions that delivered the change. Now, and, and, and who originally thought of them? So some were thought of by people at the top, some by people in the middle, and some by the guys at the bottom. Okay, so the, question, the number I'd like you to write down, this is your secret number, is 100% of of solutions that delivered the change, what percent do you think were originally thought of by the guys at the top? 100% of solutions that delivered the change, what percent of those solutions were originally thought of by the people at the top, as opposed to coming from the middle or the bottom? Write the number down. And we'll see what we have in the room. I'm, I'm not going to use zinc for this, but you um, see what... Okay, so I'm going to do the Dutch auction approach. Okay, has anybody got 100%? Okay, that's uh, okay, because sometimes you do get a few hundred percenters in the room. Working in uh, Siberia, we had a few hundred percenters there. Um, any 90, 80, 70, 60, oh, 70? 70, okay. So that's the highest number in the room. Okay, 70. 60, 50, 40, 30. 30, okay. 20, okay, hope for the minute. 10, and below 10. Interesting, so the, the, the most, I'm not a mathematician, but the mode looks like. So let's look at these assumptions. What is the assumption of a very high number? 70, 80, 90 percent. What's the assumption of leadership? They have answers. They know. They have answers. They know. So an assumption of a very low number is they don't know. And the average in the room is what you're saying is you're saying most of the time the leaders don't know. They don't know the answers. Do you think they know they don't know? Some do, some sure. don't. No. <laughs> they know. They all know. I would say majority. In the old days, they turned to God. Today, they turned to McKinsey. Why do you think management consulting is booming? Why do you think that industry is booming? Can they say they don't know? No. Hell no. What about the people at the bottom who do know, generally? Do you think the people at the bottom know the people at the top don't know? Yes. Yeah. Which is why, you know, the suits turn up from headquarters, Sonne Lumiere, here's the problems, here's the solutions. What do they say at coffee break? Bullshit. 
because we know you don't know. And we know, but we know you don't. Do the people at the bottom expect the people to, at the top to know? No. Do the people at the bottom expect the people at the top to know the answers and stuff? Is there a difference between expect and hope? Do they hope they know? Yeah. And generally, they expect them to know. Which is why the people at the top say, can't say they don't know. So they have this charade, and that's again another one of the many, many, if you like, um, consequences of this discontinuity. Our assumption is leaders should know and they should believe. The reality is they don't and they know they don't. So they pretend to know or they get themselves in. And the people at the bottom are just as guilty because they pretend not to know. They gather around the water coolers and they moan and say management should, company should, etc. So this is one of the exercises we use just to sort of begin to open up. And everybody intuitively knows this charade. This charade is happening all around the world. Um, and this hope that, for example, when you were saying, well, you know, come on, G20, 30, 40, whatever plus, solve these problems. Nobody intuitively knows that they can't. And we know they know that we have this charade because we're caught in this sort of trap of assumption. So having done that sort of exercise, <clears throat> and by the way, the average number is about what was in this room, about 20%, 15 to 20%. Um, Playing the charade is only part of it because this discontinuity between reality and assumption um, needs to be broken. And that's partly there's a fear of letting go because we like to control. We like things to be deterministically controlled. And there's also um, we're working too hard. We feel, you know, the law of thermodynamics, the more you put in, the more you get out. So we'll be on the wheel, we're running really hard on the hamster wheel, and not the working hard, good Protestant working ethic. Effort you put in is effort. Um, and, and that leads us to working hard but not smart. So this leads to unnecessary stress. So then we begin our journey on <coughs> complexity. We use the Canadian model. Um, and we look at it in terms of cause and effect. And we focus on cause and effect. Because when you have cause and effect, you can have control. So the simple, you know, that's where you have process. I wouldn't call a, an Airbus A380 in this model simple. But, you know, it's simple. You push the stick forward, the buildings get bigger. Pull the stick back, the buildings get smaller. <coughs> Keep pulling back, they get bigger again. If you do this, you get that. That's ultimate control, cause and effect. Um, then you have the complicated, and this is where you use analytical tools. Cause and effect is there if you analyze it enough. This is the world of strategy. I used to be a strategy consulting, you know, two by two matrix and models and all the rest. Um, they, they both share the same view of the world, which is a deterministic view. And then we have the big jump. And it's getting that big jump, and we have the complex, uh, and then we have the chaotic. The chaotic is the easiest from a leadership point of view. <clears throat> there is no cause and effect, so just do something, and it doesn't really matter what. So for the other three, though, the key thing is they coexist. Uh, that's the key thing. I think in any system, these things coexist. That's the view I'm beginning to come. So an organization is a complex system. But in that, you have the simple, the complicated, and complex. And so the, the trick is understanding what is really complex underneath and apply those principles and understand what is simple and complicated. So we have a game which should normally take five minutes if you are rational, but because we play with human beings, it normally takes 50 to 60 minutes for people to solve these things because they conflate those three states. And they start trying to solve the simple using the complex and the complex using the symbol. So having sort of got a, an understanding of the differences of complexity, we, we then use the lens of um, <coughs> fractal modeling. And this is Mandelbrot's set. Um, and a very simple formula. I probably got the formula wrong. I have to ask my stochastic friend if that's Mandelbrot's formula. And I understand that's a simplified version. Gives that hugely complex pattern. Discovered in the 1970s um, at the same time as LSD. Which is kind of spooky if you think about it. Um, Maybe because of LSD. Well, I, I, I never met Benoit, but I'm sure he wasn't a user. I, I, I do understand it was uh, in completely different circumstances. That model is actually quite David Mandelbrot. So we then use Sierpinski, um, and building the Sierpinski gasket, we show how uh, a logarithmic deterministic approach can actually generate complexity. So this is sort of relating to what you were saying, kind of about how. 
you know, just because something's deterministic doesn't mean to say it's not going to be complex and vice versa. So this is beginning to understand paradox um, and getting people to understand paradox. We use pictures for the, the right brain. Um, and the key thing here is there are a few simple rules. The bad thing about the bad news about complexity uh, for managers and, and leaders, there are three bad news and three good news. Uh, the first bad, the bad news is it's messy, there's waste, and we can't predict. But, you know, how many of you have children? How many of you do not have children? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warn people who do not have children. Okay? The process, birth, messy. It's messy. But it's wonderful. So, you know, mess is not necessarily wrong. And when you pick up that baby, I can guarantee you will not look down and say, Oh my God, only one made it. All those millions wasted. <laughs> there is a lot of waste in nature. There are no straight lines in nature. The natural way is naturally messy. The natural way has waste. And for those of you who don't like predict unpredictability, if you were told, we will tell you the time and date of your death and exactly what you're going to be doing in great detail for the rest of your life, would you want that? No, of course not. We like unpredictability. So it's becoming, you know, understanding that mess, waste, unpredictability, that's part of life and it's a wonderful part. The good news for complexity is there are a few simple rules and if you can understand those simple rules, you can begin maybe to deal with it. And so we use uh, Boyd's ABM to show that in action. This is uh, 300,000 Stalins flocking above Denmark. What's interesting is there's no leader there, and that's been determined by three simple rules. Separation, alignment, and cohesion. And what's interesting about these rules is they are contradictory. They are non-aligned. Separation is opposite to cohesion. So when you're looking for alignment, alignment works in a complicated <coughs> system, but alignment in a complex system will actually go against the system working. In general, not always. Working with uh, bankers looking at this, um, how many of you have worked with bankers? I mean, professionally. Basel III, full of contradiction, right? Ah, it's full of contradiction, but yeah. Now, either those guys in Basel were on LSD, <laughs> Or they were lucky, or they were geniuses. Because Basel III is full of contradiction to allow, I think, the complex system to work. Um, and, for, and this is the model of words which shows you know, 300,000 pixels <coughs> programmed with those um, rules, the same behavior. So, it begins, you know, leaders and managers are beginning to see complexity and, and how maybe reality is different. Um, we then continue with uh, fractals and show you can take a, a mathematical rule from one area and apply it to a completely different area and get the same result. So there's a, we introduce the concept of universality. You can take universal rules and apply them in a completely different context and get the same result. And also the concept of randomness. <clears throat> this is when you throw a dice and you do a dot, you throw a dice and you do a dot, you throw a dice and you do a dot. And if you follow the same rules, the halfway rule, you get the same result. So randomness can work. So having sort of set the scene, we then begin to say, well, okay, how does this work in real life? This is all very nice. Um, so we play a game. Um, and I want you to imagine you're on a tennis court, randomly distributed. Everybody in this room on a tennis court. And you have to pick two people in secret, randomly. So you pick two, you pick two, you pick two. So everybody has chosen two people in secret. And then what everybody has to do at the same time is to position themselves at equal distance from those two people. So everybody's chosen two people at random. You then have to position yourselves at equal distance. Now, the mathematical complexity of that is huge. I mean, it would take you 120 years to count the number of solutions or possible solutions. It's got more circular references than the great god Excel himself could look after. Um, how many of you would think that would be impossible? I mean, some people, yeah, it's pretty impossible. How many think it's impossible? No one thinks that's impossible. How many of you think that would take days? Hours? Minutes? Seconds? Still be, are you still awake? Okay, I'll show you the game. Um, uh, on average, about 30% of an audience would think it's impossible. 
Um, and most people think it will take a long time to play the game and, and how that one works. This is to introduce, if you like, um, yeah, introduce the concept of, of randomness. Is that the sound, please? Uh, what I'd like you to do is to pick two people <coughs> who are in the boundary and be random. So look around the room, look around this, uh, the player, so all the people scattered in space. Just look around and, and choose two people at complete random. Okay, you've chosen two people, but, and, and if you can't indicate those, then you can choose them. You can't indicate who they are. So now there's a pale. Okay, just look around and choose two people, and those are your two reference points, and you cannot indicate who they are okay, in any way. And, and you can't change who they are either. And you can't tell them what to do, even though you might want to. So we've got the boundary, so we go outside the boundary, you've got your two reference points. You're going to use the space and move slowly. Um, and uh, you're not gonna you're not gonna make any big movements. Yeah. Um, and it's a very simple objective that you as an individual have to do. What I'd like you to do is to position yourself at equal distance from those two people. So you to position yourself at equal distance from those two people. You know, it's not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. Obviously, it's aiming at you and have to adjust. Once you're at equal distance, you stop. And it's the same as if you start again until you get to equal distance. Equal distance doesn't have to be in between. So if it's this gentleman and this gentleman, just by doing this. I do any more business. Okay? How long do you think this is going to take? <laughs> Let's see. Okay, now cut on, use space, and go. leadership and analysis you should have, um, which goes against conventional thinking. That's why we lost. Let me explore why that is. We uncover the principles that allows that uh, game, if you like, but also how organizations can handle complexity, um, what principles you need to have in place. We organize this into yin and yang. Uh, some of them are hard, some of them are soft. We use Taoism uh, to enable the Western mind, I think the Asian mind is, uh, has, is lucky, the Western mind is brought up you know, with right or wrong. Uh, it's either or, left or right, uh, the good or, or the, the, the rich or the poor, heaven and hell, you know, God and the devil, it's always bang, 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 and we think either or, either or, either or, either or, and we have a great difficulty thinking both and. And I think what Taoism gives you is that sort of uh, ability to think both and, completely contradictory things in harmony together to create something greater. So the principles are purpose, and you talked, I think, um, Sean, we talked about you know, purposefulness. Purpose is absolutely critical, but it's normally implicit uh, within you know, the agent's explicit objectives. You have rules, but you rely on people, uh, the skill and the will. 
you have boundaries, but you also have a lot of freedom to act. And you have very clear measurement, but you also have a high degree of tolerance for ambiguity. <clears throat> now, what's interesting in the research is when and we use the self-assessment for this is most organizations have a good score. Um, most organizations have a pretty good score on these principles, uh, which means that most organizations already have what they need intrinsically for their organizations to navigate complexity much better. In terms of retrospective research, uh, um, two research projects last year, one in America, looked at these principles against financial performance in the uh, aviation industry and found you know, the, the ones that had, there was a very, now correlation is not causation. Um, but you know, I would argue there may be some causation here. And if you think about those principles, you, know, you look at these principles, it's like, duh, you know, if you have an organization that's got all of this, you should, you should be doing fairly well. And sure enough, in, uh, in the aviation industry. And then another uh, research project, it's all independent research projects uh, at the uh, other end of the scale, at the team level, and in, in Russia and Siberia. Again, project, project uh, teams performed far better with these principles, uh, which were more active. Um, when you've got these principles in place, as a leader, what do you think you should be able to do? Play golf. Say again? Play golf. Play golf. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, why do executives play golf? Do they enjoy the game? Probably not. <laughs> what do they do when they're playing golf? What do you, anybody play golf? What do you do when you play golf? I know, you hit a ball in the hole, ridiculous game. What do you actually do? What do you actually do? <laughs> To the leaders of other companies. You talk to other people, you press the flash, you see what's going on, you do the deals, you connect. You connect outside your own boundaries. So playing golf, yes, and metaphorically, but also realistically, it allows them to actually start leading sideways and outwards <coughs> rather than just downwards. And, and the thing about leadership in a complex system is it's got to be sideways and outwards. And it's also, in a complex system, it's got to be upwards. Why? Because the people at the bottom know the answers. <laughs> So rather than seeing leadership like shit, something that slides downhill, we should see it as something that needs to go upwards, outwards and sideways. And I think that's what complexity science enables people to see the reason for that and how they can do that. Um, but there are some uh, challenges there. So the next level we go to, and we use attractive theory. I'm looking at the time. I've got five minutes left, and then we'll go into questions. I've got a whole lot of other stuff I could show you, but if you, want, you can always uh, read the book. Is, um, Using a phase space uh, of people and task, this is the uh, Hershey Blanchard approach to leadership. Um, we also then flip it over and look at it from the followership perspective. <clears throat> Seeing leadership as movement between four behaviors, you're either selling it or telling it, or involving or devolving. Um, and we allow people to see how, how they are choosing those behaviors in a mindful way. And what's interesting in the research is that the telling and selling side <coughs> The average score should be about where it should be for a good score, but a big range. The you know, perfect score in each is four on this particular model. Um, on the other hand, people are using too much involvement. They're involving probably far more than they need to. The reason for that is they know they don't know, but can't say they don't know, but if they involve themselves and others, then they may be able to get over that. So they're probably overdoing it. And the hardest behavior is letting go and devolving. 30% don't do it at all. 70% don't do it enough. So the biggest challenge for leadership is learning to let go and <coughs> sorry, <coughs> understanding that. And the reason they're not letting go, by the way, is probably because they're running around saying, who are your two people? Who are your two people? Who are your two people? They're trying to manage the complexity of the world using deterministic approaches. And when that doesn't work, what do we do? Well, we'll just use more of them. And if that doesn't work, well, hell, we'll lose more of them. And we'll keep on doing this until we get the answers. And they're working really hard doing a whole lot of stuff they don't need to do. So what, we, what I think complexity science lens gives leadership is the understanding is, you know, if you did a hell of a lot less, you'd probably get a hell of a lot more done. Um, and this is not you. How many of you speak Mandarin? Now, I'm going to have to ask your forgiveness now because I'm going to mess massively your language. I understand this says Uwe Arjö, Dajö Royu, Uwe Arjö. Uwe is a very ancient Chinese view of leading by doing nothing. Uwe Arjö. But it's not not doing nothing. 
Um, the throne there is taken from the inner court of uh, Emperor Kung He, and above his throne is Wu Wei. Emperor Kung He was one of the hardest working, most diligent emperors in Chinese history, very successful. But what he understood is letting go and letting things flow sometimes is the best approach. Um, and what we talk about, and then Da Zhe is the highest form of wisdom, uh, but it can sometimes look foolish. And when we come back to the phase space, you know, in terms of skill, will, telling, selling, involving, devolving, you can use attractor theory to show that the point attractor of leadership, the point of leadership is not to lead. You know, once you've sold the why and you tell the what, you've involved for the how, you should be able to let go. Um, and it's understanding when you push and when you pull. So I think in summary, um, I think that complexity science has certainly helped me make sense of the world, but it also helped thousands of executives to make sense. And I think I would summarize it by saying that firstly, you know, complexity is not a problem. It's, it's something to be embraced and enjoyed. It's natural, it's an opportunity, and it can be understood and leveraged. And I think that's the first hurdle with, 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 with managers and leaders. Complexity science can help on three levels, the 3M approach. I had a, a, one of my MBA students, I taught MBAs for 10 years, one of my MBA students wrote a really good paper on this, how complexity science can help by on three levels, metaphor, uh, which hopefully I've shown you using fractals, uh, modeling, which I haven't really shown you, but I could, and then manipulation, three M's of, of using it. And then finally, it's not a panacea, it does not you know, replace the traditional, it supplements and complements it. Um, and uh, that's my time. Now, as moderator, I'm going to ask a quick question. How many of you actually have questions? If you, I, don't, I, don't know what, I don't want to know what they are now, but how many of you, I just want to know how many of you actually got questions? Just put your hands up if you have a question. You're not asking now, just do you have any questions at all? How many of you have that? One, two, three, four, five. That's it? Okay, good. Then we'll do the traditional question and answer. Because if all of you have questions, I get you to write up and then I'll reply in writing uh, after the weekend. Okay, so who wants to kick off? Yeah. So, you have a really complex situation here. You have the company facing existential threats, but you got this quarterly earnings statement. So you got it. The company is facing really existential yeah, threats. Yeah, it's working. And you just hold it can up. you hear me? Yeah. All right. Then how does, um, but you've got these intermediate goals that are very deterministic. And so amidst the, um, I guess the question, how do you get to the intermediate, intermediate goals uh, while you're trying to establish this uh, Cal uh, framework for longer term? Okay. So when I'm working with uh, finance teams um, and, you know, CFOs and things like that, I think the first thing is to do <coughs> is get, um, performance on short term. Uh, and then you can show them the, uh, the correlation between uh, uh, share price and profit, which is fact. So this sort of scrabbling for short-term performance is, 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 is stupid. Now most people understand that, um, but there are still some people out there saying, I've got quarterly, quarterly, quarterly. It depends on the strategic situation. So um, I can say this now, I'm not, uh, Nokia are uh, um, taking over or merging with Alcatel, Lucent. Uh, and they're doing a share price thing. Because the markets do, uh, look at quarterly profits, they have to be very careful in the intermediate term on what they do. So it's, it's a tension. There's no either or here, it's both and. Um, but I think the first thing is, is a disaggregation of this short-term mentality thinking that is performance. That's the first step. It doesn't mean to say you ignore performance short-term, but it's a disaggregation of those two things. Does that answer sure. the other question? Yeah. And there's, there's lots of data to show that the correlation between P ratio and um, and EBS work. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Some of that, yes. Uh, the second question then. Uh, I, sorry, I came in half a minute. So I don't know whether you said this. Uh, mm -hmm. I, oh, I think over the past year, I started thinking about uh, uh, complex adaptive organizations. Uh, and I wonder whether you have talked about uh, whether 
whether you talked about agile organizations or if you have not, can you say something about them? Sure. I mean, essentially, we're moving. What's interesting is uh, the evolution of organizational uh, structure is moving from this sort of very functional silo, so finance, marketing, HR, operations, and lots of layers, moving to much more fluid, flatter, and also matrix organizations. That's happening around the world. How many, I mean, it'd be interesting, you all work in organizations, I guess, or well, some of you do. How many of you have just one boss? How many of you have more than one boss? So we've got more people, more, we've got more than one boss. I mean, for those of you who just got one boss, the matrix is coming. Okay. <laughs> it's a natural evolution. You'll get dotted lines and stuff. So what's interesting there is a matrix organization is more complex inherently than a functional one in terms of how to operate it. So the conclusion we can make is the more complex, you answer complexity with complexity. And you don't answer with complexity, you don't answer complexity with simplicity. So the more complex things are, the more complex organizations are becoming to deal with it. However, there are some inherent simplicities. But one of the challenges for that, of course, is this silo mentality and working across boundaries. You know, we know that, but how do we cross those boundaries? And I think, you know, knowledge is not behavior. Knowledge is not behavior. Learning is not behavior. Knowing is not behavior. What drives behavior is belief and intent, desire and belief. If I believe something, I might actually do it. Most smokers know smoking kills you. But they don't believe it, not for them. That's other people. So, so how do you get that belief is, is experimentation. And um, essentially, let me just show you, uh, this is uh, the buttons model by um, Kaufman <clears throat> that shows random graphs. And, and we, we use this about generating meaning and random conversations rather than buttons and threads. And you can see there are jumps. But what we tend to do is we tend to cut an organization and cut those random conversations. Um, and I think, you know, for an organization to become fully cast, complex adaptive, etc., is you, we need to encourage as much cutting across the boundaries, both uh, functionally as well as hierarchically, in order to get random conversations, which do get innovation and astonishing results. Uh, two, two stories, one student used when they saw when they saw this when ah epiphany put it into their organization got a forty percent increase in productivity. You know, astonishing result. Another student decided to do it even more randomly and said to everybody, okay, you know, let's do some random connections. And uh, they a big multinational and their managers were randomly connecting across boundaries. Um, just to say hi and what are you doing sort of thing. And they found in one part of the company they've been working globally on a very, very Expensive multi billion initiative. And one part of the company is a project team that was really doing well on, on let's say, task A, but got stuck on task B. And that was preventing them from advancing. And over here, in splendid isolation, these guys were working on task B, but because there was a dependency on task A, they got stuck. And randomly they connected and they saved billions in terms of RD and speed to market. So I think I. But you can't predict it, and you can't guarantee it. But I think organizations are changing. I think the more we encourage this leading sideways over these boundaries, the better results we can get. Does, does that answer your question? Uh, half of it. What's the other half? The other half is uh, what you described sounds like a, a blind man feeling for things. So perhaps what is the role of management and leadership? is to encourage them. To encourage blind, random walks? Yeah. So it could there be more systematic and more principled approach to... Well, they, I mean, the, it can be done in a systematic way, but you, if you over-systemize it and you over-complicate the model, you get the opposite effect. So I could tell you the detailed story of how they did that, but they didn't do it. You know, in terms of the pool center, I mean, I'll show you the results of the the call center when you put this in. Um, here's the next slide, there you go. This is uh, exploiting buttons and what we call the butterfly effect. Catalytic mechanisms, CATMEX, using catalytic mechanisms to get, so small intervention to get big change. Um, and what he did was he, he went across, basically what they did is they, um, the, the story was they, uh, the call center facing closure, 
Um, and they got the consultants in because they needed to be more productive. So they systemized breaks, they systemized lunch, they systemized where the coffee machines were. You know, if you move coffee machine A 1.3 meters to the right because worker 5, 8, 12, 17, and 82 use that coffee machine, that will cut the travel time down by 8.5 seconds per worker per day, which translates into, you know, real detailed, good analytical stuff. And, uh, and they did all that stuff, and they got a 5% improvement, but it wasn't enough. And they were facing with loss of jobs. And when he saw this, this graph of phase transitions, he said, my God, I've had an epiphany. What's that? All my smoke? Not all my smoke is more productive. <laughs> what do you think was going on? They're interacting. Yeah, they're interacting at random. And what do smokers talk about? No. Everything at random. So what do you think he did? Well, he didn't force everybody to smoke. He, went, he, first, he, he first negotiated space. So when you do a catalytic mechanism or a catnet using butterfly effect, negotiate space from the, the headsets because what you're going to do is radical. And you call it a pilot, you call it an experiment, you don't say you're going to change policy. Okay, as soon as you say changing policy, what do policy makers do? <coughs> and then he moved all the coffee machines in one place, he got rid of all the break times, he got rid of all the lunch times, and he put a pool table in there and some bean bags. And that's what he did. Now this is part of his MBA thesis. So this was academically scrutinized. <coughs> and essentially, he got astonishing results. And he got phase transition, he got variability, he got butterfly effect. So the first two weeks, things got worse. Okay. The management said, what the hell are you doing? It's getting worse. You know, crash, crash. And he said, no, you gave me four months. Go away. He said, I can do anything. Four months, because he said, going to close it in six, it makes no difference. And then it got better. So the management said, oh, I'll flash in the pan, it will never last. And then it got worse again, back to where it was. The management said, ah, told you so. And normally on a change program, if you don't understand complexity, phase transition, butterfly effect, etc., on a deterministic program, you, you shut it down. But this is highly complex, using randomness so you can't predict. So, you know, you need to do run through. Uh, and then it got better, then worse, and then bang, they got that result. And that was the phase transition job. Um, and so, you know, you can, you can use that randomness. Did he mandate that? Yeah, he did. He, he, he sort of, a certain amount of control. He got rid of stuff. He took stuff out, and he made some changes. But did he tell everybody, okay, I'd like you all to randomly get together and randomly generate productivity? Nah. Rather like that game. If I had said equal distance, and let's over-engineer this, 1.357 meters, three decimal points, it's got to be the truth, and 2.78 degrees. You'd never get there in that game. So it's about having some control and determinism, but only as a burning condition. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, anybody else? Uh, actually, I'll ask Just a comment. There, yeah. there was a Fortune 500 uh, CEO who basically said, my job is to make knowledge accidents happen. That's it. And it's a contradiction in terms, because if you make it happen, it can't be an accident. So, you know. But you're providing an environment. You enable it. You encourage it. You enable it. And then knowing when to let go. And I think for leadership, <coughs> what our complexity science shows is why, you know, why the highest form of leadership is not leading, why that is. You know, it's been around for thousands of years. Lao Zhe wrote the Te Tao Ching. When did he write that? Two, three thousand years ago. But nowadays we can understand why. And I think that's, the, that's what complexity science brings to the world for, the, for, for my area of work, which is, which is leadership. Final question, because I think we're approaching lunch tonight. No? What time am I with you then? 12.10, is that right? 12.10. Yeah, so I still got some time. I'm very difficult moderating myself. Yeah, I think should be moderating this. That's okay. I can take over. <laughs> okay. Any other questions at all? Um, uh, uh, what's at the back? One, there was one at the back. He was waving his hand, and then, and then. Just a quick one, because following uh, a colleague over there who talked about line walk, because line walk only increase complexity rather than reduce it. So, in the example that you give, how do we, as a management, know or leader know when to stand firm? and when to give up, when the writing on the wall is against you. Okay. I think that you, you have to begin to reframe what you said. 
because you're saying, you know, reducing complexity. It's not about reducing complexity. You know, the mindset, that mindset is a deterministic mindset looking at complexity and saying, no, 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 complexity, we need to reduce it. So it's understanding what complexity is. Now, having said that, there are some complexities that are created. For example, using a process approach in a complex environment, that will create even more complexity. So there are two levels of complexity now. It gets kind of like fractal and contradictory. Stacey's complex response of processing theory will show how human beings have the amazing ability to make, to make the simplest thing highly complex. So understanding that dynamic and understanding what CRP is. It's not, and this is no magic bullet. You have to understand these things a little. But then understanding that complexity is a natural process if you understand it and how it works, and you can recognize true complexity, then you can begin to let go. Yeah. I think the second thing is, learning go is hard to do. That's something very, very difficult. And, you know, there are ways of doing it. We use Aikido, Gojuru, and meditative techniques. To understanding when to let go is the first, and understanding how is the second. Um, if you want more, read the book. If you want even more, come on our course. Yes? Nick, I think uh, there's a difference between Accepting complexity, and if complexity is man-made, it can be reduced. Because the complexity we build on it, how to unravel that complexity? I think we, we I, I would love to have a conversation with you later, but mm. this is my thing. Okay, thanks. I can, understand, I can understand where you're coming from. I think man-made complexity can be reduced. However, man-made complexity is also entirely natural. Guess what? We're part of nature. Ta-da. We're part of the system. You know, if you look at the Earth, it's one system, and we're part of it. So understanding in an organizational level, and if you look at, you know, there are organizations that have applied complexity science and created complexity, as I've shown you a few examples, to get better results. I think the problem we have is we see complexity as something as a problem, and it's not, and something to be reduced, and it shouldn't be. It's entirely natural. And man-made complexity is just as natural in some instances as nature, because we're part of nature. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm hoping this will make sense ultimately. But the, I, I, what I was thinking about listening to this is one of the gaps, as I understand it, in uh, complexity research is how hierarchy emerges. Um, you know, there's tended to be a, you know, historically a lot of work on, on things like, uh, you know, blocking models, these things that have, have a, uh, flat interactions out of which structure emerges, but uh, less of an account of the way that uh, hierarchy emerges. And I touched on this, I, I've been thinking a lot about this in, in terms of uh, Holland's uh, signal and, and boundaries framework, because that's the whole purpose of it, is to sort of think about uh, how and why, uh, what are the mechanisms behind, uh, behind the emergence of hierarchy. So I, I'm, you seem uniquely well positioned to be thinking about that because you're walking into organizations that are hierarchically organized, and, and I, so I'm, I'm I'm just sort of curious if there it, it's it feels like what you're doing is taking things that are already hierarchical and injecting non-hierarchy in them into them. But what I'm curious about is if you, you've also reflected on um, the mechanisms by which the particular hierarchical forms that you find in these organizations. In. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, there's a paradox. The reality is we live in hierarchy. Yeah. Reality too is hierarchy is natural and very useful. Um, and I think like a lot of things, maybe we need to rethink what hierarchy is. <clears throat> and we still have hierarchy. But it's hierarchy, Jim, but not as we know. So that's why, you know, I see leadership needs to go upwards as well as downwards. Now there's a hierarchy there. I'm leading your following. But I'm leading my boss. And he's following me. And you know, that idea is not new. You know, Gandhi, I must follow my people, form their leader. General Lafayette of the, the Continental Army, you know, the guy said, got rid of the bricks. I think you stay there. I must follow my soldiers, so I'm their leader. So, this concept of leadership and followership being pinned onto an individual and being pinned onto a role and being pinned onto attributes, yes, and 
There's another way of looking at hierarchy, which is much more fluid and dynamic. But it's very clear who's leading. So, for example, in the combat team attack, which I was talking about, you've got 300 people, vehicles all over the place. When a, 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 a one striker or even a trooper says, right, here's the FUP, we follow that. Even though he's 10 levels down, he's telling that organization what used to be what the boss said. But you need an element of understanding and, and awareness for people to do that. Both on behalf of the people who are following, to be brave enough and knowledgeable enough and have enough belief to take initiative in that lead, and also for the leaders to know how to follow. And that's why a lot of leadership stuff is now about listening rather than talking. Why is that? Because you, know, you need that. So it's a journey. It's a journey. I'm not against hierarchy. I love it. <laughs> and there's no way of looking at it. Okay. Final question, I think, before lunch. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I just curious when you say when you say where is the we that mean you said we means do nothing, but actually a man standing away means uh, do nothing against the, the trend. The blow. So you have, that mean you have to understand the, or predict the, the trend. So exactly. Well, understand the flow rather than predict it because it may be unpredictable. I mean, wu wei ai zhe, wu wei literally means do nothing, but the wu wei ai zhe means leading by doing nothing, but the next level is not going against the flow, not going against the complexity because complexity is natural. Um, and understanding where that flow is, is is part of the challenge. But I think complexity science at least at least gives managers and leaders a, a platform on which to follow that, rather than some sort of ancient philosophy. You know, philosophy is great. HR people love it. Operational people get it more or less. But the technocrats, uh, technical people, you know, where's the maths? Where's the science? So I think it's understanding flow. And for me, flow is inherent in complexity. But it's inherently not predictable, but it has a predictability about it. The weather is a complex system. But you can predict, more or less, hot in the summer, cold in the winter, 30 degrees in Singapore. More or less. <laughs> but you couldn't have predicted yesterday that you'd be stuck in traffic all morning because of sudden storms. Maybe you could, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, are you going to wrap this up? Well, yes.